In 1804, the Holy Roman Empire falls. If you're a regular listener to this podcast, you'll know that while historians put the fall of Rome during the life of Augustine and use the term Byzantine to describe the part of the world ruled by the empire, the people called themselves Rome. Then the church named Otto I the Holy Roman Empire. The Byzantines, who considered themselves the Roman Empire, were not fans of this. The empire was the area that today would be Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Austria, the Czech Republic, and as well as some parts of France and Western Poland. Then, in the 16th century, we had the Reformation. I'm going to be talking about that in our podcast in January, but what you need to know for today is that between the start of the Reformation and the time the Holy Roman Empire falls, the church loses control of the people. They begin to read the Bible for themselves, schools are set up, and new Protestant churches arise. The church tries to stop this by putting people in jail and even killing them, but the Protestant churches only grow in popularity and strength. In the hundred years before the end of the Holy Roman Empire, the states really started to rule themselves, although still sort of under the rule of the empire. But there was a strong sense of nationalism that was building. They spoke their own languages and had their own cultures and traditions. There was also a very horrific war between Austria and Prussia. So in 1800s, when Napoleon shows up on the scene, the Holy Roman Empire is no longer Catholic. It was never actually Roman, and it's not really an empire anymore. Napoleon came from France and defeated the empire. The empire was officially dissolved. It had been in rule for over 1,000 years. And then suddenly, just like that, gone. A new French confederation was formed. Now the Germans were not happy to suddenly have French soldiers on their land. The Germans started to push the German traditions in a way to stop the French from taking over their culture. They refused to speak anything but German. And they held lots of German festivals, German plays, and German concerts. The arts was very important to keep the French language and culture out of Germany. This is very important for our story. This was really one of the first times in history that people started calling themselves German. The German person was not necessarily someone from Germany, because that really wasn't even a nation at this point. A German was anyone who spoke German, embraced German art, and was not French. Then Napoleon was defeated. And in 1815, just two years before our song was written, the Congress of Vienna happened. At the Congress, France was punished, and laws were passed to create a balance of power, and Europe was started. Austria gained a lot of land at this Congress. In fact, it was Austria and Prussia that were the most powerful. That's important to our story. Austria and Prussia. Another huge thing that happened was the German Confederation was formed, and this included the area we find ourselves at the start of our story. You see, our Christmas carol was written in 1818, just 14 years after the fall of the Holy Roman Empire, and only two years after the Congress of Vienna. In a small alpine village, a young assistant pastor is watching a play. Theater, as I just said, was growing in popularity. Not only did people enjoy it, but the plays themselves were a way to keep the German language and culture alive during this difficult time period. The young pastor's name was Joseph. The play he had just watched told the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. The play ended and after visiting with his friends for a while, Joseph headed out into the night. The air was cold and crisp. He pulled his coat tight and started to walk. He was walking along a path and he reached an area where he looked down at a nearby village. The world was in chaos right now. Borders were being drawn, torn down, and then drawn again. There was always the threat of war. But at this moment, as he looked down at the tiny village, he thought it was the most beautiful picture. The tiny German village with smoke rising from the chimneys. He could imagine the moms and dads sitting by the fire with the children all tucked in bed by now. Just at that moment, it started to snow. It was the kind of snow where the snowflakes seemed to float through the air. Joseph imagined that this perfect winter night could only be matched by the night Jesus was born. Joseph stood still for as long as he could. 
He wanted to remember this moment forever. As he stood there, he was reminded of a poem he had written a few Christmases ago. He began to think what his congregation needed was a way to always remember the beauty of simplicity. In all the hatred for the French and the uncertainty of borders, it was the beauty of Christmas and the peace of Jesus that his congregation needed. He decided his poem should be set to music and sung at the Christmas Eve service. Joseph visited his church musician, Franz, and asked him to meet at the church. The next day, he went to the church to meet up with Franz, but when they arrived at the church, they found that the river near the town had flooded, and the church was also flooded, and the organ was not working. Perhaps there will be no Christmas Eve service. No, there must be a service. We'll get this cleaned up, and we'll have a service. You have a guitar. You don't need an organ. That Christmas Eve at the St. Nicholas Church, Franz played his guitar instead of the church organ, and the congregation heard for the first time his song, Silent Night. A few weeks after Christmas, the organ maker came to the church and fixed the organ. Before he left, he asked Franz to play something to make sure the organ was working properly. Franz sat down and played Silent Night. The organ maker sat in awe. That is the most beautiful song I've ever heard. Would you like a copy of it? Yes, yes, I would. So Franz wrote out a copy and handed it to the organ maker. The organ maker took it back to his village. In his church were two families who were very popular singing acts. Remember, during this time, German singers and actors were very popular, and those pushing the German state would make sure the German singers and actors were able to perform. The organ maker played the song at his church, and both of the singing families loved it. They both added the song to their list of songs to sing the following Christmas. The next year, the two families started singing Silent Night, and then more chaos started. A congress to make all the German states work together was formed. There would be no tariffs, they would all have the same currency, and Prussia would have the most power. And Austria was not allowed to be part of any of it. This was not good for the little village that inspired the song. Now the Prussian king was the most powerful king in all of the German states. And in 1834, the king of Prussia had a popular singing group come in and sing Christmas songs for him. The singing family, who attended the same church as the organ maker, was picked as one of the performers. They sang all of their Christmas songs, but it was one song that won the king's heart. He thought Silent Night was the most beautiful song he'd ever heard, and he made a Christmas degree. From this day forward, I decree that every Christmas Eve, this song must be sung. So it was now a law. Every Christmas Eve, the churches all across the German states ended their Christmas Eve service with the song Silent Night. In 1839, Franz died. At that time, no one knew he was the composer. Most believed the songs had been written by a great famous composer, maybe Bach. Franz had 12 children and was too busy being a father to be a famous composer. The year Franz died, the Austria singing family, the Rainers, traveled to the United States of America. The singing family had a chance to go to New York City. They held a concert at the Trinity Church and ended their concert with the song Silent Night. The Americans loved it. A priest at the Trinity Church named John Young translated the song into English. And his choir added the song to their list of Christmas carols. He also published the song in a Christmas carol book. Back in Austria, the tensions did not end. There was uprisings, reformations, and riots. And the call for a German nation had Austria in its crosshairs. Some had Austria part of the new nation they wanted to build. Others did not. You see, not everyone in Austria was German. For example, the Hungarians living in Austria really did not get along with the Germans. There was another war in 1864, and borders were redrawn again. By 1870, less than 10 years later, the borders had been redrawn, and then redrawn again, and then redrawn again. It was a time of war. 
borders constantly changing, and for the people living in the area, it was difficult. The little village where they just wanted to live and raise a family was in multiple different countries in just a 10-year time span, and their sons were called to war over and over and over. On top of that, the conflict between the Protestant church and the Catholic church grew. In 1900, the river near St. Nicholas Church flooded again. This time, the church foundation was completely destroyed beyond repair. Not only the church, but the small village Joseph had seen was also destroyed. Everyone had to move to a new location farther away from the river. For those villagers, the hundred years since the song had been written had been very difficult, and it was only about to get worse. In the years from 1906 to 1912, the leader Wilhelm II grew his army. For the first time, Britain got involved in all the fighting, and in 1914, a duke named Franz was shot, and war started again. But this time, not just amongst all of the small states trying to form Germany, this time the whole world got involved. It was declared they would have one final war, a war that would end all wars. The constant changing of the borders would finally end. This would be resolved finally, once and for all. The war to end all wars, or as we know it today, World War I. On a cold Christmas Eve, a soldier starts to sing his favorite Christmas carol. And across the field, a German soldier sings along. It goes down in history as the silent night. The soldiers put down their guns, and they spend a day playing soccer and even exchanging gifts. The song Silent Night was a reminder to the German people who were living in a time of chaos that not all was lost. In our world today, with uncertainty and busyness, it can feel at times that the future is, well, uncertain. We can feel that the foundation of our nation is not as stable as we once thought it was. Our culture is changing quickly and heading down a path that can be frightening. But there's something about Christmas and specifically about Christmas Eve. There's something about singing the song Silent Night that brings a calm and a peace over our souls. I believe that God gave the song to a congregation during a time of extreme unrest. The congregation that first sang that song would not know peace at any point in their lifetime. A child who sang that song the first night would have seen multiple border changes, reformations, riots and wars, and in their old age, their village would be wiped out by a flood, and their grandchildren would fight in World War I. Not a lifetime of peace. They never knew peace. Well, they would not know peace on a national level, or earthly peace, but they could have peace in their hearts. But that's really the point of Christmas. There might not be peace in our world, or in our nation, or even in our homes. But no matter what, there can be peace in our heart. You can have the peace the song Silent Night reminds us of. That peace in your heart that only comes from Jesus will be there no matter what. In war, in civil unrest, in political fighting, in storms, through it all, you can have peace. Why? Because one night, a holy night, a virgin gave birth and into the world came Jesus. God himself came into our world. Through Jesus' lifetime, there would be no peace, and yet he came to bring peace. You see, the world may not be peaceful, but we can rest, not in earthly peace, but in sweet, heavenly peace. In today's episode, we talked a lot about families, and it was really families that spread the joy of Silent Night. So today with this episode, especially since it's also Christmas Eve, I did something a little bit different. You would have noticed that in today's episode, we had guitar and flute. Two of my daughters, Jocelyn and Emily, were the musicians for this podcast. Jocelyn on guitar and Emily on the flute. And now as we end this episode, I wanted to do something similar again and show families singing Silent Night. Now, there is a singer named Leslie Matter, and I'm going to have a link to her YouTube channel, which is a lot of fantastic music. But one of the songs on her YouTube channel was from a few Christmases ago, where her and her family simply sat around the piano and played Silent Night. So on this Christmas Eve episode, there's no other way that we could possibly end the episode 
except with the family singing Silent Night. So enjoy this family as they sing and then check out her channel. Merry Christmas, everyone, and I'll see you next week with one more episode in our History of the Carols. So